Welcome to this exciting video on the story of a gifted, gifted convert can alert us to some of the issues involved in a new evangelization by Mara's father, Jean Thornhill. It is not difficult to recognize that a new evangelization being undertaken by today's church presents a considerable challenge. How many in today's church, even among our leaders, have a clear idea of what it should involve in practice? The Second Vatican Council has called the church to a renewed self-understanding and to the vitality to be found in the sources of our shred shared life in Christ. The Word of God and the sacred mysteries of the liturgy, we know that this reawakening has hardly begun and is it to be carried forward in the lives of people today. As Archbishop of Milan, the late Cardinal Maria Martini was an outstanding pastor, inspiring people, young and old, with this, his teachings. A leader who could hold the attention of tens of thousands of young people clearly had something to give the church of our time. For this reason, I have in recent months been studying his addresses, hoping to write an article describing the way in which he communicated to his listeners the life-giving message of the scriptures, while I have been asking myself how I can present my findings. I read for the first time an article written by Christopher Dawson describing his conversion to Catholicism, why I am Catholic, published in the Catholic Times in 1926, 12 years after his conversion. His thoughtful analysis has alerted me to aspects of the task we must be prepared to undertake if we are to succeed in our new evangelization project. In the present article, I want to share what I learned from Dawson's conversion story. It will serve, I hope, as a hopeful introduction to a later article presenting Martini's contribution to a new evangelization. I think it may also help those guiding prospective converts through the RCIA program to understand the complex process their candidates are negotiating. Dawson was received in the church in 1914. He was 25 years of age, already recognized as a thinker of outstanding talent. Sir Ernest Barker, himself a distinguished academic who became an international authority in the field of political science, recalled reviewing one of Dawson's works that he had began to learn history the day he became Dawson's tutor at Oxford University. Dawson's gift as a historian of cultural development makes his description of his conversion valuable for the insights it contains. The life he shared as a young boy in the closing years of the 19th century, as his family lived in the residence of his grandfather, the Anglican Bishop of a rural diocese in Wales, was, he later judged, that of a world that was already passing away. The culture of Victorian England, Dawson wrote, was grounded in an intense faith in the Bible, but this situation was already being undermined, as highly placed and respected churchmen fell under the influence of critical analysis of biblical text, which presented the biblical material as an assortment of historical documents of varying authenticity. As a consequence, for many Anglicans, the only standard of authority in the Protestant world was losing its objective character. Thus, when young Dawson went to boarding school, he found a religious outlook very different from what he had been brought up in, more an ethics than religion, for which a haze of vagueness and uncertainty hung around the most fundamental articles of Christian dogma. Disillusioned by what he found, Dawson wrote, for some time, he gave religion away completely. In time, however, he was drawn back to what has been such an important dimension of his childhood, and he sought 
a way forward by studying the history of Christianity. He was inspired, he tells us, by the lives of Catholic saints and the writings of mystical writers of the Catholic tradition. For a time, he lived an eclectic religious life, taking part in Anglican worship and deriving inspiration from Catholic sources mentioned and the development of the Oxford movement as an attempt as he'd attempted to revitalize the Anglican tradition. Traveling on the continent during this period, he was impressed by what he saw of Catholicism as a living religion, very different from his Anglican experience. Visiting Rome, he found himself challenged by the vitality of the Bacuc culture, brilliant achievements during the Reformation period. He came to recognize, as he put it, that Catholic civilization did not end in the Middle Ages. After his graduation, Dawson sought to put right the ambiguous situation he found himself in. He understood, undertook a study of the writings of Paul and John in the New Testament. Looking back, he commented that it was appropriate that, the, that enlightenment should have come to me through the Bible. The teachings of Paul and John opened his eyes to the organic unity of the living Catholic tradition. He saw that what he admired in Catholic saints and mystical writers was not the achievement of individuals, but the expression of the supernatural life described by Paul and John. That exists in every faithful Christian. It is an organic way of life. He recognize that in, this involves the incarnation of the Word of God, the sacramental life of the church and the external order of the Catholic Church as it carries on its ministry of reconciliation and sanctification. His familiarity with the current terminology used by the Catholic Church led him to refer to the supernatural life implanted in believing Christians, something of for which his study of the teachings of Paul and John had given him a profound appreciation as sanctifying grace. As he concluded his article, Dawson quoted Ploss, a well-known French theologian of the time, writing that the deeper truths in life are often taken for granted and run the danger of not being fully appreciated. Ploss pointed out to an example of this in the fact that many Catholics were losing their appreciation of the real meaning of sanctifying grace and its fundamental importance in the life of the faith. I find that fact that at the very time Dawson threw an openness to the message of the scriptures was discovering the mysteries at the heart of the Christian faith. Our sharing in the Trinitarian life, a leading Catholic theologian in touch with the mood of Catholicism at this time, was expressing concern that our people were losing a full appreciation of the implications of the mystery which is at the very heart of their life as believers. Reflection on the implications of the situation described by Dawson can help us understand the tasks that we face today as we attempt a new evangelization. Study, studying the thought of Christopher Dawson, I have been amazed to find how writing early in the 20th century, he anticipated much that has become clarified by advances that have since been made in bibli into biblical scholarship. For example, though he did not use the term, he recognized that the Judo-Christian revelation took place through a salvation history, giving expression to the ways of God, the relationship of God to his chosen people. As an adoptive one, he wrote, has its origins in a series of historical events. And in the writings of the prophets, we see how successful crises in Jewish history were the occasion of fresh revelation of the divine vocation of Israel and of the divine purpose in history. Dawson's summary of the realize, realization of Christ event as the climax of salvation history is worth quoting. And a quote, the Christian doctrine of the Incarnation is not simply a the theophany. It is a new creation, the introduction of a new spiritual principle which gradually leavens and transforms human nature into something new. This unique divine event gives unity to the whole historical process. 
the Christian conception of history is essentially unitary. It has a beginning, a centre and an end, which transcends history. There are not historical events in the ordinary sense of the word, but acts of divine creation to which the whole process of history is subordinate. The world transforming events which change the whole course of human history have occurred, as it were, under the surface of history, unnoticed by historians and philosophers. This is a great paradox of the gospel, as St Paul asserts, with which such tremendous force the divine purpose of creation, which has been hidden throughout the ages, has now been manifested before heaven and earth by the apostolic ministry, the fulfillment of the prophecy towards which the whole history of Israel tended and has been concealed from Israel by the scandal of the cross. It is not difficult to recognize that these views of the development of his understanding of the organic unity of Christian faith made clear for him in his study of the writings of Paul and John. And as himself acknowledged, this understanding was made possible through a faith-filled attitude to the message of the Bible as he learned as an Anglican. For the new evangelization project to succeed, the church must develop healthy critical awareness of the Catholic culture that has made its life in the modern era. This is delicate matter. Most Catholics see the need for a more life-giving spirit in the church. But constant fruitlessness, critic <coughs> but constant fruitless criticism does more harm than good. What is needed is the purposeful of ways of finding a new vitality. Reflecting on Dawson's story has confirmed for me an appreciation of the contribution of Carlo Maria Martini can make in the meeting this need, as I hope to explain in a further article. Christopher Dawson's conversion to Catholicism was inspired by the conviction that in the Catholic tradition, he had found the mystery that is the living heart of the Christian faith. It was not an attraction to align himself with the church as a historical institution. Christine Scott, in a biography of her, a father historian in the world, makes clear that while in his published works, he is very measured in his criticism of the institutional church. In private conversations, he had severe criticisms to make along the lines we have been considering. He considered the attitude of the institutional church to the broader community to, to be too sectarian. He considered the church to be too institutional, in a bad sense, mechanical, so as to say trying to get results by organising organisation and formulas, so that propaganda as dominant within it as outside. The friend who recorded these comments after a long conversation with Tiger Dawson, as his friends called him behind his back, added that with regards to the more legalistic aspects of the church life, Dawson felt free to make his own decisions. In his analysis of the aftermath of the flowering of the Christian culture in the 11th and 13th centuries, as Catholicism became and began to be at odds with the emerging culture of modernity, Dawson judged in what was perhaps his most original work, religion and the rise of Western culture, then an important contributing factor was a papal leadership in the hands of men more interested in the politics of the time than in the spiritual renewal that had taken place and which had so much to offer in a world undergoing a momentous cultural change. Mm -hmm.